good uh, afternoon and good um, um, morning, uh, Kerry and the people in North America or wherever you are, even if it's good evening, if you are in Asia. Uh, it's a, I'm happy to have uh, Professor Kerry Coglinizi, uh, a good colleague and good friend uh, as a guest in, in our seminar on theories of governance. And Kerry will uh, present today um, a paper on seeking uh, regulatory excellence, as you see there. Uh, and it actually speaks um, about the topic as, that he, he know, not only knows well, he's also one of the excellent uh, researchers on uh, regulation and a co-founder of the journal Regulation and Governance. Uh, carries uh, many things and the uh, authors of, 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 of many books and important papers, but he's also an institutional uh, builder and is one of the people who are building the PEN program on, uh, on regulation, um, and which is kind of uh, uh, a center, one of these amazing centers in North America on the topic. So welcome, uh, uh, Kerry. It's a pleasure to have you and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, David. I appreciate the invitation, and I'm glad to be here to talk with you about rec regulatory excellence, which maybe to some of you might seem like an oxymoron, but uh, I hope uh, to uh, persuade you that it's a and it's important concept or pursuit for regulators around the world. In part, you might have that reaction about uh, regulatory excellence being an oxymoron because uh, regulatory failures uh, abound and are are also highly visible. I think there's a an asymmetry in what we see in the world about regulation uh, more easily than the failures we see more easily than the successes. Uh, to some extent, one might say every time an airplane takes off safely and lands safely, that's a regulatory success. Every time a depositor can put savings in a financial institution and then have it there a year later to withdraw it, that's a regulatory success. Uh, in, in some sense, regulatory success might be thought of as the way life is supposed to be, or maybe in some countries, you know, the way the life is usually uh, if, uh, if regulation is working well. Uh, but I do think that it's somewhat less visible. But that doesn't mean that regulatory uh, quality doesn't matter. In fact, it, you know, it, it, it very clearly does. And I want to start uh, before I get to my main remarks about theory with just a few uh, concrete examples that I uh, hope uh, if you aren't already uh, inclined to think that regulatory quality matters might help you at least see how, how it can. The first example comes from uh, 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 building codes in Nepal. And in 2015, uh, the uh, country experienced uh, what is designated as a major earthquake and uh, experienced 9,000 fatalities and 20,000 injuries and extraordinary property damage uh, as well. Uh, Nepal lacks uh, modern, uh, up-to-date uh, building codes, and its system of regulating the construction of, of building codes is uh, not of great quality. Compare that with a second case now of Mexico in just two years later, with also had an earthquake in that major category, uh, but only uh, resulted in 360 or so deaths and about 6,000 injuries. Mexico does have in place modern building codes related to uh, earthquake uh, resistance and structural integrity in earthquakes, uh, but it doesn't have uh, necessarily uh, the most uh, uh, rigorous of enforcement of those codes. So there are some fatalities, but just having those codes in place uh, seems to have uh, made a, a considerable difference. Let me now turn to the third case uh, just uh, one year later 
in Alaska. And again, a major earthquake. This one actually closer to population centers than either of the ones in Nepal and Mexico, uh, but nevertheless uh, resulted in zero fatalities, and zero injuries, and actually rather minimal uh, property uh, damage. Uh, Alaska has uh, modern building codes uh, that Mexico had in place, but it also combines that with uh, effective enforcement of those codes. So I, I think this uh, kind of comparative cross-jurisdictional uh, uh, set of cases suggests that regulatory quality matters. And we find much the same when we look within a jurisdiction of uh, a variation. Uh, a study conducted by some colleagues at the Wharton Risk Center here at the University of Pennsylvania compared uh, buildings in the, just one jurisdiction, controlled the jurisdiction, uh, the state of Florida, buildings that were built before the introduction of a modern uh, building code standards, in this case, standards designed to protect building structural integrity in hurricanes. Uh, and then they compared those that were built before with those built uh, after and found that uh, the buildings built after did uh, withstand the hurricanes better and suffered about 50% less damage and uh, resulted in uh, you know, savings of, of, from damages uh, that uh, vastly exceeded the costs associated with, um, with putting in place uh, the structural uh, uh, aspects of the building called for by the code. So I, I, just this just by way of situating and again, responding to anybody who might be saying that at the outset, regulatory excellence, uh, what is that? Does it really matter? I think it does, okay? And so what I want to do today is talk about uh, how to uh, pursue regulatory excellence. And I wanna do that first by, uh, since this is a, a, a seminar on theories of governance, I'm going to start with uh, some uh, historical, brief historical background on some theories related to regulation that I think most closely speak to the question of regulatory equality. And I wanna just take those somewhat in historical or chronological order. Uh, very briefly, and then, then what I'll do is turn to what are, what what are the characteristics that define regulatory excellence, drawing on some research uh, that we have done at the Penn Program on Regulation over the last uh, several years, uh, in, in part uh, at, at the commission of a uh, Canadian uh, energy regulator, but which I think apply across uh, all fields of regulation. And then I'll talk about from the same project. Uh, steps to becoming an excellent regulator. And then I'm going to conclude by uh, suggesting that excellence for a regulator comes back to really thinking about uh, people and the quality of the management uh, within an organization and the management of those people uh, and what they, they ultimately uh, do with their time and in their interactions with others. But let me first just start with this regulatory uh, theory development and very briefly walk through three, uh, what I think of as ma major uh, theoretical uh, uh, pursuits within the field of regulation broadly. The first is what I'll, I ca would call market intervention theory. And this is uh, a, a response to the question of when should uh, government intervene in uh, private market activity. This is a theory that really is uh, you know, among the oldest of what I'll talk about here, it goes back to uh, Pago and uh, the uh, articulation of externalities that he identified in uh, 1920 as being one of the uh, times when government uh, ought to be intervening with regulation. And one finds in conventional uh, microeconomics textbooks, uh, policy analysis textbooks, this uh, emphasis on externalities as a, as a market failure, and market failure is the uh, answer to the theoretical answer to the question of when government should intervene, uh, 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 when, of course, the, uh, 
the, the marginal social costs associated with uh, some kind of market transaction are not fully internalized uh, by uh, private actors. When their incentives are, their private incentives are not aligned with the larger uh, social interests. That's uh, certainly one of the major areas of, ex of externalities and market failures. Uh, there are other examples of market failures in that are articulated uh, information asymmetries when consumers lack the same information about uh, the quality of products uh, that are, are being purchased. Uh, they lack the same uh, knowledge as the, the sellers of those goods or services. Uh, that is often thought of as the theoretical justification for a lot of regulation in the consumer protection realm, certainly uh, in the realm of, of pharmaceutical uh, 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 review, for example, um, the COVID vaccines uh, that are making their way around is an example of where uh, we have regulation justified uh, on that on that grounds. And then, of course, market power, uh, monopolies, and other concerns about the concentration of market power, another kind of market failure. So this market intervention theory uh, answers the question of when regulation is justified to align incentives better uh, in the private sphere with uh, social uh, welfare. This theory uh, has given rise to uh, an institutionalization here in the US, for example, an executive order in 1993 calls upon agencies to make essentially a determination uh, that uh, there is a market failure. Uh, the, the executive order says that federal agencies should promulgate uh, only those regulations necessary by some compelling needs, such as material failures of private markets, uh, for example. And in, this is also reflected and in, in institutionalized in a further uh, circular A4, which uh, it guides uh, regulatory agencies in the, doing their regulatory impact analysis to look for the market failure or other justification for regulation before they go forward. So we have a theory and then we also have uh, some institutional response to that theory uh, going on. A second theory that has, I think, reflects the same pattern of theory and then uh, institutional response is uh, what I would call the theory of institutional and procedural design. Others might uh, refer to it as capture theory. Uh, it grows out of now we go from the 1920 and with uh, Pagot to the 1950s and uh, with Marver Bernstein writing uh, about uh, uh, the regulation of uh, industry uh, in the US and the way that industry uh, gets uh, close to and connected with uh, the regulators and uses it to their advantage. This was formalized in the economic literature in 1970 with George Stigler's uh, well-known theory of economic regulation, uh, in which he articulated how uh, businesses can use regulation as barriers to entry, ways to actually reduce competition and advantage themselves over uh, uh, over the overall uh, social interest. So we have, in some sense, uh, with this uh, 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 emphasis on regulatory capture, a response to the market failure theory, which suggests that regulation, uh, at least as a, well, as a normative matter, but, but some would say as a positive matter, are also arises in response to market failures. Here, uh, we have, uh, researchers uh, in the middle part of the last century in political science and economics uh, starting to say, wait a minute, you know, uh, if uh, regulation is uh, being used by industry as a barrier to entry, it can actually work against the overall public interest. And this has given rise to uh, institutional responses throughout uh, uh, administrative law uh, there's an emphasis on uh, procedures for transparency, uh, for public involvement, and, and for independent judicial oversight of what regulatory agencies do. 
as a way, often explicitly, of combating the dangers of capture. And one sees uh, in, for example, OECD recommendations. Uh, uh, here's an example from about 10 years ago, but the OECD actually urging uh, countries to consider creating formal uh, legal uh, uh, structures of independence for regulatory agencies when it's necessary to maintain public confidence in those agencies, when there's significant e economic impacts and a need to protect the agency's impartiality. So theory about the dangers of capture leading to the institutionalization of procedures and structures uh, to maintain independence. Uh, in fact, uh, the OECD, uh, you know, in one report uh, specifically links this regulatory integrity idea, that is some degree of autonomy from uh, regulated entities as it leading to achieving better outcomes and that you can get more integrity, the more independence one has. Uh, so this is uh, the second theory. The third theory that I just want to, in, the, in the, his, this historical overview, is what I will call behavioral optimization theory. Uh, to some extent, the roots of this maybe can be uh, traced uh, to uh, work in the field of regulation. Uh, I'm thinking here of John Braithwaite and Ian Ayers, uh, well-known book, Responsive Regulation, thinking about how uh, we not only can just answer questions about when to intervene and how to structure agencies, but actually what to do to induce behavioral change and that uh, regulators ought to be uh, responsive. We have also emerging after that a movement toward new governance, uh, an emphasis on flexible regulatory instruments and uh, involuntary efforts, all in the service of trying to optimize what agencies, uh, regulatory agencies are doing. The most recent manifestation, I think of this, comes in uh, the sphere of behavioral, application of behavioral economics and use of nudges as regulatory tools. And the OECD, uh, again, as an example, has uh, recognized that this is now at the forefront of a lot of thinking about regulation around the world. And we have institutionalization, not, not just an intellectual fad or a theory, but institutionalization through the creation of various nudge units or behavioral insights teams that are occurring uh, within governments around the world. So what, why do I go through this? I think it's important because all of these theories do contribute something very useful to thinking about the quality of regulation, which is my focus. Uh, but they also, I think, have, uh, like uh, a lot of theories, uh, uh, you know, some limitations associated with them. They are all focused on, in some sense, uh, a narrow slice of what regulators do. Uh, they tend to be focused more on nouns rather than verbs. So uh, regulation, choice architecture, let's just find and design the right rule or the right way of creating a nudge or a default, and then we will get the results that follow, as opposed to thinking about uh, regulatory quality as an ongoing activity, regulating more than just regulation. So uh, they do bring important, again, uh, concepts to, the, to bear, you know, emphasis on public welfare and public value and, and emphasis on behavioral change. All of this is important, but what, uh, when I've come to this project now of thinking about regulatory excellence, which came to us uh, by a regulator who asked this simple question, what makes for an excellent regulator? Uh, I found that these theories by themselves uh, were limited and what really was needed to answer the question of what makes for an excellent regulator was something more integrative and something more uh, dynamic. Now, when we went uh, on our pursuit in this project 
for uh, uh, some kind of answer to this question, uh, we found that uh, instead of finding one virtue, much like Socrates, we found many. We talked with uh, people in regulatory agencies around the world. We talked with uh, folks in bus the business community, folks in the in environmental and, and uh, uh, civil uh, sphere uh, who were interested in regulation. We scoured the academic literature. We scoured uh, strategic reports by regulators. We, we all sorts of other uh, OECD and other reports on regulatory quality. And uh, we found that there was a tremendous amount <laughs> of, of, uh, of, of, of frameworks or, or topologies or characteristics of regulatory excellence. So much so that this, I didn't think would be of immediate value for regulators because uh, they need uh, to have something like all theories do to try to simplify and uh, try to manage uh, the range of, of qualities that they should be aspiring for. So they need a lodestar to be looking for. And it, you know, it, it, it turned out in some sense, I, I, I think that almost any positive adjective one could think of about anything except maybe physical beauty or taste, uh, I heard somebody explain as that's what their understanding of quality regulation and, and, and an excellent regulator. So one, one thing we did is a study is we, we tried to, uh, through uh, a series of, of, uh, of, of coding exercises with, with other researchers, tried to look through, for example, uh, hundreds of these uh, topologies that we found in in various uh, reports around the world and just created this word map that uh, when we tried to put these qualities into about two dozen uh, categories, uh, you, know, you can see the biggest word here reflects what uh, came through as the, some of the more important uh, characteristics that uh, transparency, uh, perhaps responding to the concern about regulatory capture, uh, but also being efficient and effective, uh, high integrity and expert, all of these things matter. Now, even this uh, exercise didn't, it, in my view, lead to uh, the kind of focal focus that uh, could be actionable. So we took it a little bit further and this is where we developed uh, uh, a, a tripart understanding of what regulatory excellence is. It, 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 it's the, it's, it is the competence, the getting the job done, changing the behavior and leading to improved outcomes in the world. That, that stellar competence is also important. And I think most regulators tend to understand that, but it's also about having integrity. That is you know, the avoidance of capture, uh, the avoidance of corruption, certainly, but also a real commitment to fulfilling uh, the democratic mandates uh, that may have been given to a regulator, uh, fulfilling uh, overall pursuit of, of public value as opposed to, to private interest. And, and that, but the one that I think most regulators uh, have, have had the harder time uh, seeing at least immediately is that part of what makes for an excellent regulator is also their engagement with others. Uh, that re regulation is a relational uh, activity uh, relational, certainly with the industry being regulated, but also with the broader public, with the broader government. We then uh, gave some additional content to this by highlighting three tenets within each of these uh, atoms of, of regulatory excellence. Uh, and I'm happy to go into these uh, further uh, uh, along the way. But I want to turn in, in the uh, 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 remaining a few minutes here to becoming an excellent regulator. How, how, does, how does a regulator go about that? Well, uh, as a management framework, uh, this, it strikes me, is what regulators are aiming to do. They are operating at the left side of this figure within their organizations, and then they're moving and taking actions, uh, making decisions, uh, establishing rules, enforcing those rules. Those are their actions. Why? 
to try to shape the behavior of the regulated industry. Why shape the behavior? To lead to the kinds of substantive outcomes, the correction of those market failures, uh, certainly. Uh, along the way, though, they also have uh, perceptual outcomes that they're, they should be thinking about because they're creating them, whether they realize it or not, uh, the degree of lead to which their actions are viewed as legitimate, the degree to which their organization is trusted. Uh, those perceptual outcomes can themselves help shape behavior, but they're also affected by the, the substantive outcomes. So there's some interaction. But everything on that right there, uh, as I've indicated with the bracket, those that, that can be thought of as the outcomes or the performance of the regulator. What the regulator who has to do, the manager of a regulator, these, this is the part that the regulator has the most control over. Uh, ultimately, it's interesting that the quality of regulation gets judged by the behavior and outcomes that are outside of the bounds of what a regulator has direct control over. Uh, you know, in some sense, uh, the success of a regulator is, is outside of the regulator's hands. In this sense, perhaps the regulator might be best compared to a parent who can do a, a lot to raise uh, and nurture a child, but ultimately, you know, whether that child is a responsible, caring uh, an adult and upstanding citizen is going to be in the hands of the uh, the child uh, grown to be an adult. Uh, so what what I want to focus on here is just a framework that uh, uh, that that highlights the the key ways to become excellent within that box there, uh, focusing on the people within the organization, the internal management uh, of a regulatory organization, its mission, its resources, its human capital and training. Uh, the degree of autonomy it exhibits from uh, political pressures, industry pressures, and so forth, the kind of culture that it has within its organization, whether that culture is aligned with ongoing learning and uh, pursuit of excellence certainly matters. Uh, but also the priority setting, uh, the decisions that are made. Uh, uh, we hear a lot today about risk-based regulation, for example. Uh, the problem solving that they undertake by creating rules, applying them, enforcing them, those are the solutions to regulatory problems. And obviously that matters a lot too. But so too does the uh, engagement lastly with uh, the public, uh, how, uh, how effective and empathic is that kind of outreach that matters as well. I want you to see that in terms of the integrative nature of this framework here for managing toward regulatory excellence, that it has embedded within it the three main theoretical uh, orientations that I introduced at the outset. Uh, the market failure concept uh, can be used as one tool in thinking about when should the regulator intervene in the private market? That's what that theory is all about. Uh, thinking about the autonomy and the culture within the organization as a, a response to the potential for regulatory capture, uh, that's there as well. And then uh, thinking about choice architecture, the design of rules, the new governance uh, strategies and so forth are all part of problem solving as well. So they, those are there, uh, together these make up uh, key uh, strategies toward achieving regulatory excellence. And uh, I think one could take uh, the regulatory model that goes from the regulatory organization and its actions to performance and, and, and array that along uh, the, uh, uh, the x-axis here, and then think about those atoms or tenets of regulatory excellence along the y-axis and begin to have a grid that regulators can use as a scoping tool to see how well they are doing uh, with their pursuit of regulatory excellence. Let me just close uh, in, uh, and then open it up for questions by suggesting that this is a different approach to uh, thinking about 
uh, regulatory quality because it's not just about when to adopt rules or how to design those rules or whether regulators should be structured as independent agencies or not, or, or about what kind of regulatory designs or choice architecture should be used. Uh, it's about all of those, but much more than that too. If there's any institutionalization that comes out of a theory of regulatory excellence, I'm not sure it will be reflected in an executive order, the creation of some kind of special unit or the establishment of some kind of particular institutional structure. Ultimately, I think the institutionalization of regulatory excellence lies in the hearts and minds of those who work within regulatory organizations and those who lead them. Because only if those people are committed to doing their utmost to uh, deliver public value, to, to uh, pursue those atoms of regulatory excellence and to learning and improving uh, and, and to, to adapting, uh, only then I think can a regulator expect uh, to achieve uh, true excellence. So uh, thank you very much. I would uh, welcome and uh, be pleased for your comments and questions. Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, let's take uh, the slides and see you and myself. And I will take, uh, I have a few questions, but I'll take questions from the audience first. So who wants to come first? I have a question. Uh, please. This is Scott Jacobs. Uh, I'm just a consultant on regulation. Um, Hi, Scott, where are you? I'm, I'm, I'm blackened out because- uh, <laughs> Okay, go on. Not presentable. I'm from the garden, fresh from the garden. Uh, Carrie, may I call you Carrie? Yes, by all means. Carrie, it's uh, a lot easier than my last name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, how, but how but you, I'll tell you, plenty of people get the first name wrong too. That's all right. So I, I will answer to just about anything. <laughs> I've been called just about anything too. I suppose. <laughs> Thank you so much for for unwrapping this really difficult knot. Um, there's some very interesting things. I took quite a few notes. I have two two questions for you. I'll make it brief. One is, my, my, my general feeling is that it is impossible for regulators to be excellent, uh, mm -hmm. regard, despite their best efforts. And there are two reasons for that. One is a reason that, that in your model is seen as exogenous. But actually, I think it's the reason for, for many regulatory failures. And that is that the, the legislative mandate is wrong. And in many cases, these laws are outdated. They reflect other economic times other technologies, other consumer choices, and the, cons and the regulators are uh, basically uh, bound by the wrong mandate. So it, don't, it doesn't matter what they do. So I wanna, I'd like to hear your thought on why, why is that exogenous rather than endogenous to what, what we're doing? And what about parliament as a regulator? Does your model apply to that? The second thing is, uh, the other reason I've seen is that regulators are too risk adverse. And this is a political economy issue because they're not blamed for things that go on unless they fail to prevent them. And so they tend to, they, they act too much. They, 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 they try to prevent risks without understanding that there's an optimal risk in society rather than a minimum risk that they're always trying to achieve. And so uh, because ministers lose jobs when a crisis occurs and, and, he, and the minister didn't regulate, this risk aversion uh, results in an enormous quantity of bad regulation throughout the world, but it's particularly anti-innovation. So I'd like your views on that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, certainly you've, you've, you've uh, put your finger on how this is not easy, okay? It's, you know, uh, to identify even these categories within, uh, uh, you know, the, the realm of adjectives and attributes is uh, one thing, but then to actually within any particular organization uh, go about defining them with precision, I, I certainly don't want to convey any illusions about how easy that is. It's also not going to be easy to uh, A, satisfy everyone, uh, B, uh, achieve perfection. <laughs> And I don't think regulatory excellence necessarily means achieving perfection. Uh, I 
think they're, you know, with a lot of realms of regulation, uh, we're dealing with, with sometimes uh, very low probability, uh, but perhaps high consequence events. And, uh, you know, even a regulator that's doing uh, excellent work at, man at, at, at ensuring that an industry is managing those risks because they're low probability, it's going to be hard to know how well you're doing at any given time unless you have some proxies that are reliable. Uh, but, but it also means that on occasion there will be failures, there will be disasters. As you say, that can lead to real risk aversion on the part of regulators. And I think uh, there's a, uh, I certainly want to resist the notion of uh, risk based regulation being something that focuses on the risks to. Uh, the regulated entity. Yeah, not that uh, regulators should be uh, reckless about their own organizations and their own uh, the in the reservoir of institutional trust, but uh, but but you know they there there certainly is uh, a, a real need for awareness of the kind of risk aversion that you talked about uh, that could lead to, in some cases, over regulation. I think. That overregulation also can can occur when one thinks about uh, regulating as something about just setting the setting some rules and then going on, uh, rather than taking a more active approach to regulation, which might entail regulating in in, in some sense less, but monitoring and uh, and overseeing more. Okay, and and being attentive, especially in areas of new technology. To the real value that those new technologies can deliver, uh, but um, but but not uh, not uh, also looking away and 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 over oh, you know disregarding the possible uh, downsides for those new technologies. So it, I think that uh, at the end of the day, excellence in regulation is a lot like excellence in a number of pursuits. It's not going to mean you achieve perfection. And excellence is something about the pursuit or the journey much more than the attainment. Uh, and you may be, you know, right. And maybe the one thing that everybody can agree on is that, you know, there will never be true total excellence uh, from a regulator from that regard. But taking an attitude of seeking to continually learn and recognizing both the downsides of overregulation and the downsides of underregulation, I think, uh, is the mindset that uh, an excellent regulator would have. Thank you very much, Kerry. Any mm -hmm. any, any other questions? Uh, Malcolm, please. Uh, yes. Hi, Kerry. Good to see you. Uh, Hi, greetings. Malcolm. Greetings from uh, Boston, uh, your old home. So. <laughs> Good um, to see you. Yeah, a couple things. Um, and the first isn't really a question. The second one, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it into a question. Um, you show the earthquake pictures and um, it is a habit of uh, regulatory uh, scholars to write books after a catastrophe saying, um, you know, this was terrible and we should have seen it coming. All, and there's tens of thousands of books written after um, Woods, and many of which say all the signs were there and we, we should have picked them up but they didn't write those books beforehand. Um, so they're sort of basically um, useless <laughs> in that regard. I think there is a special job that I wouldn't place on you, but on all of us, um, that we have to be able to assess competence prospectively, uh, even on catastrophic uh, risks. And if we can't, uh, and that would have a lot to do with um, degrees of vigilance, imagination, um, anticipation, um, you know, I think these are parts that sit in your um, sort of excellent delivery um, piece of your triangle at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. But I think, mm -hmm. I, think, I think they need an awful lot more detail and teasing out so that we could make sensible prospective assessments of who was actually um, doing um, vigilance well, particularly for catastrophic risks. When you switch to your excellence uh, topic, and um, yes, I've watched your work with great interest on this over the over um, many years. Um, 
any, anyone who tries to define excellence um, ends up with this very long list of positive values, either nouns or adjectives, and usually a mixture because you can't <laughs> force them all one way or the other. Um, and then you're going to do prioritization and selection and then put them in categories. Um, and, you know, I think developing the very long list is useful because it raises people's awareness of a lot of different dimensions of performance, all of which are worth thinking about seriously. Um, and as a practical matter, prioritizing them is good uh, because you give what you call a lodestar, some things that you can focus on. Um, but in discussions of that, uh, that kind of su uh, subject area, the values at stake with practitioners, they say, you know, life is more complicated than that. The real problem is that your list of positive values, they actually conflict with each other. It's not, it's not that uh, you just have to put them in order. Um, is that you've got to make uh, awkward choices between them um, in all kinds of situations. So, you know, you, pr you, you stress independence, but you also want to be responsive. Um, well, the degree of distance or empathic engagement is therefore a rather complicated thing to figure out with the industry. Um, we would always stress responsiveness to democratic accountability, but you want to protect yourself from political uh, corruption and interference. Um, transparency is the word that shows up biggest on your word map. Um, but tra and transparency is a, a useful default value, but it's got all kinds of caveats to it. Um, you don't want to be transparent about your audit selection criteria. You don't want to be transparent about your um, inspection schedule if you're doing unannounced inspections. If you're dealing with you know, criminal groups, um, you might use covert surveillance or undercover operations. They're not any untransparent, they're actually deception um, perpetrated by the government. And it's for the sake of effectiveness and diligence and, and not being um, passive. Um, and so uh, when these things collide, uh, there's very complex judgments to be made. Um, and I don't know how far you've gone down the route of studying um, first of all, which of these values um, is never traded um, because they're sacrosanct? And, and I would say professionalism is one. I would say respect for basic human rights is another. Um, but there aren't many others. All of these others, consistency, transparency, predictability, uh, openness, uh, they are all uh, sacrificed on occasions for the sake of other perfectly good <laughs> reasons. So they are justifiable trades being made uh, between these positive values. And, and, and that seems to be a much uh, richer and complex area and, 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 and not terribly well navigated um, you know, by the community so far. Thank you, Malcolm. Yeah. Terry? They're all part of, uh, well, to uh, use your terminology, uh, the craft, uh, right? That's why it is a craft. Uh, you know, it is, uh, as you say, uh, uh, I, so well in, in, in your work, but also your comments here, you know, there's a balancing that needs to be done. And, and sometimes it's a balancing and, and a set of trade-offs that need to be made. Uh, and, uh, it is, um, it, and I think it would be presumptuous, certainly, of any of us, in, in, in order to declare that there is one, uh, you know, fixed uh, algorithm that that would would trade would 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 reflect that the proper trade off right. for all times, right? Uh, and, and I guess that's why I think uh, there's only so much value that these historic uh, theories of regulation can provide because they tend to make things look like they can be fixed. We can just map out uh, the marginal cost curves and marginal uh, for, you know, private cost curves and the marginal private uh, social cost curves and sort of look at where, they, uh, where the demand and the supply curves intersect and we've got, we've got the answer. And that's the solution to uh, this. And that's why I think that, you know, the, the emphasis on thinking about regulation as a verb or a gerund, I suppose, more than, uh, uh, than a noun is what's, what's so important. So uh, it is an ongoing pursuit. You will always be uh, susceptible to uh, criticism. 
it's probably no accident in a way that the ancient Greek word for uh, excellence uh, was erete, which today we don't really see people using that word for excellence or virtue, but where it is used today is to reflect uh, and, 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 and represent the, the uh, ridge of a mountain range, the little knife's edge that you can see climbers traversing. And I think that's the metaphor that for what regulators find themselves in, navigating this very thin edge that in, in precarious situations where one false step uh, can lead to uh, a disaster. And uh, just as in uh, mountaineering, there's tough choices that have to be made. You're trying to uh, you know, balance uh, you know, the, the risks and the hazards along the way with the pursuit of your goal. And, uh, and you're trying to manage risk. I mean, I think this is a, another concept that you have uh, done so well in articulating, Malcolm, is that we're not, we're not trying to eliminate all risks. Uh, we're managing them. And management is, uh, is an activity and a craft. Uh, it, it, re it reflects those balances, those trade-offs uh, that you've talked about. So uh, there are, uh, uh, as Ron Heibitz would put it, no easy answers, right? <laughs> so I have an easy question for you. Uh, and afterwards I will ask uh, Marcus to, to, to ask. Uh, and my question is, um, and it goes uh, back to Scott Jacobs' wonderful um, uh, a uh, sentence he said in the early 2000s, he wrote, uh, this is the golden age of uh, regulation. And for me, it was, wow. And the golden age of regulation, if we are putting in, it into this uh, framework, the question is, are we really in the uh, golden age of uh, regulatory excellence? So looking historically, and I will ask you on the future later on, looking historically, um, do we have better regulatory um, systems? Are we more uh, excellent uh, in what we do? Well, I guess uh, I would say it's a, that's a question that where we would have to get some more specificity. Who is the we? Uh, but I, you know, is if we took sort of some kind of global mean of where regulators are today as opposed to where they were, you know, fifty years ago. Um, you know, I think we have have better analytic tools. Uh, we have, you know, better capabilities of processing data, better opportunities for learning, uh, better uh, communicate, better and easier forms of communication, both with peers uh, at, in other regulatory agencies around the world, and uh, and back and forth with. Uh, with folks in industry and within the academy. So, uh, you know, we probably have better capacity for excellence, but, you know, and this goes back to another thing that Scott said in his, his comments, it's not as if, uh, you know, the world is, is fixed and exogenous either. So the, the, um, you know, the challenges that we face today are ones that are more difficult as well. Uh, in fact, you know, I see that we have, especially with emerging technology, uh, you know, a real, uh, uh, you know, increasing gap between the speed at which uh, certain kinds of technologies are emerging and the ability of regulators to follow those and, uh, and monitor them well. We need to, we do need to develop, uh, you know, better uh, computing capacity, but also better human capital to understand the challenges that are created by a host of, of new technologies, whether it's social media, uh, whether it's uh, precision medicine, whether it's uh, artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, distributed energy systems. Uh, we're facing a, a, a huge tr transformation in the economy, all of which can be very positive and this is the other thing about regulation where, you know, I think uh, Malcolm's point about balance and trade-offs is important too. It's not as if with regulation, we necessarily want to get rid of the activity that's being regulated. It's valuable. 
it's valuable, but we want to uh, mitigate the, the harmful effects to society from them. And when the technology is moving quickly, our, the capacity to understand that uh, is uh, diminished. So I think we, I, I, I think that, that the, uh, uh, the state of the world today is more sophisticated, but also more challenged perhaps than ever before. Thank you, Kerry. And uh, please, Marcus. And we have another question with, uh, in the chat from Suzanne. So Marcus, you, you go first. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. That was most interesting. I wanted to ask you if you find there's any difference when you're talking about regulatory excellence and you're the, the organization which is being regulated as a government body versus the organization being a social media company, basically a supernatural national entity, uh, which is kind of difficult to, to pinpoint. And mm -hmm. Uh, to regulate. But my, I have a second question based on that. To what extent can regulatory excellence be achieved by building regulating, regulation into the actual product development? And, and is that being done anywhere by realizing that when you're building, for example, a self-driving autonomous car, that that car is by very essence going to create regulatory issues and, and working with the regulator when you design the car to create that kind of regulatory excellence which you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, I think uh, there is uh, uh, an applicability of, and, and perhaps it goes to, to Malcolm's point about sort of the generality also of the atoms of excellence, that, that is adaptable to a wide variety of contexts. I have, uh, uh, seeing light bulbs go off in the minds of, of educational administrators who are who don't think of themselves as regulators, but but they're managers of public institutions, uh, school systems, and uh, they begin to realize, wow, we not only have to make sure that children are being educated well, but we are doing so in a way that maintains integrity and, and, and involves parents and we're engaged in empathic in, in engagement as well. So I do think that there's applicability when the entity is government. I do think uh, to go back to a point that Scott made earlier that sometimes governments are in and, and the legislatures, uh, they, they could also benefit from, from this way of thinking too, too and that Sometimes they, these other parts of government uh, create a, a limitation for a particular regulator. The success of a regulator may not just be dependent on the industry, which is obvious, but it's also dependent upon that larger governmental sphere. And if the regulator is not given a mandate that's up to the task, uh, then what does excellence mean? Well, I do think, and there is a, uh, a section of the report uh, that uh, is on our website, bestinclassregulator.org, uh, all one word, bestinclassregulator.org. And the final report there does have a, a, some discussion about what, what can a regulator do to pursue excellence when they're operating in an environment in which they don't have the tools, the resources that they really need. <clears throat> and I think, you know, you can't expect people to do more than they they can do, but you can't expect them to do the best they can with the tools they're given. Uh, as to your second point about building in regulation with the technologies uh, that are emerging, I think this is uh, an area where cooperation with regulators is important and where flexible regulatory strategies uh, are useful. I've written about uh, what I call management-based regulation where uh, regulators don't actually impose uh, some kind of specific outcome that has to be achieved or the application of some specific solutions, but rather what's mandated is a learning process, a management system uh, that needs to be developed. And, and we see that actually in the US with respect to the development of autonomous vehicles, our federal uh, auto safety regulator has issued guidance encouraging uh, the automakers to put in place very their own internal regulatory systems. I published a book called Regulating from the Inside, which really is focused on getting companies themselves to 
to think about regulation uh, as an internal management strategy. So, so I think, yes, uh, we, we can benefit from and ultimately want to encourage private sector firms to be doing their own risk analysis and their own uh, reg internal regulatory analysis. Uh, not only in, you know, in your case, you talked about the end product, right? An autonomous vehicle will have to make some moral trade-offs and some, some uh, you know, trade-offs that have an impact in the world. There's got to be some kind of programming within the system, uh, but also within the larger uh, corporate setting, no matter what the technology is, uh, I think it's useful to have uh, have the benefit of that management-based regulation. Others have talked about it as, you know, enforced or mandated self-regulation. Thank you very much, Kerry. Uh, we'll take a uh, last question from uh, Suzanne. Uh, Suzanne, can you do it? Um, yes. Sure. Okay, so, hi, yes. Kerry. Uh, I was wondering, given the language that you're using, navigating, uh, thinking about what you can do, being flexible, why you might not add a fourth theory that describes what you're actually describing, which is pragmatic. Mm -hmm. By making excellence, which we, it's hard not to want excellence, you're then pushed, as you have been by these questions, to divine what constitutes excellent. And I think what you're describing is you're describing a different Greek word than the one with the E, praxis. You're describing mm -hmm. what works. Mm -hmm. We will go with what works within the situation and what is available. How's about that? Amen. Okay. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I, I think that's I think that's a fair point. And I think it's the 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 a much better response than mine, probably, to Malcolm's question as well. Uh, as always, Susan, I, I, I agree. Yeah, I agree with that very much. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a good way to end. Then. That's total <laughs> heated agreement. All right. Thank yeah, you agree. very much, Susan. I agree. Yeah. This is a very uh, good way to, to end and to invite you uh, to the rest of the talks in the series. I will send uh, notes in the email uh, networks in the, uh, and over Facebook. And we will have Kerry again with us uh, later on, I think in May or June on management-based uh, regulation, which is one of his uh, uh, major contribution. So thank you very much, Kerry, for excellent uh, presentation, so provoking. And I uh, would like to thank you all for taking part in the series. And I hope you will join us again um, for the next seminar. Good evening, good, good morning, uh, and hello to you. And thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, all. <laughs>